The message today is entitled, The Choice. A lot of us make different choices in our lives. Sometimes we make choices that we think are good choices. Sometimes we think they may be the best choice we can make. But later on, we find out that that is not so. Maybe they weren't. And uh, I want to share an example of this. There was a minister, a Boy Scout, and a computer expert. They were the only passengers on a little airplane. And the pilot came to the back cabin and said that they, the plane was going down. But there was a problem. There was only three parachutes and four people. The pilot said, I should have one of the chutes because I have a wife and three children, three small children. So he took one and jumped. The computer whiz said, I should have one because I am the smartest man in the world and everybody needs me. So he took one and jumped. Now, the pilot thought he made the best decision of his life because he thought that was the right choice for him because his wife needed him, his kids needed him. The computer expert thought that that was the best choice for him because he thought he was the smartest man in the, in the world and all the world needed him and all his computer expertise. But was that really the best choice that he made? <clears throat> the minister turned to the Boy Scout and with a sad smile said, you are young and I have lived a rich life, so you take the remaining shoot and I'll go down with the plane. But the Boy Scout said, relax, Pastor. The smartest man in the world just picked up my backpack and jumped out. <laughs> so this is an example for us that, of course, I don't think this is a true story. It's just an illustration. This is an example for us that sometimes the wisest decision that we think we can make, sometimes the best choice that we think can make, we, we can make may sometimes be the most foolish or the most unwise choice we can make. And so much depends on our choice, on the choices that we make. Our key text that Yuri read was in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And it says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We all have a lot of choices in our lives. We have big choices. We have little choices. And uh, let's just bring some examples. I, I want some of your help from the audience. What are some examples of big choices in our lives? So big things. Career. Career, okay. A spouse, choosing a spouse, yes. Baptism. Getting a decision to get baptized. Schooling, which school you'll go to, what you're going to study, right? Job. Choosing a job, yes, these are all good big choices. Any other ideas? Choosing Jesus as Amen. Choosing Jesus as your Savior, that is is the, actually the choice that we're going to talk about today. You hit it, Daphne. So uh, other big choices, we have financial choices, we have relationships, relocation. Mm -hmm. We have choices, as Brother Duarte mentioned, to live. So we have some choices that are for our self-development, choices that are for our good. Those might be choices to exercise regularly, choices to eat healthfully. We also have choices for self-destruction. What are some choices that would lead to self-destruction? Maybe alcohol abuse, tobacco abuse, Lack of exercise. not exercising, eating unhealthfully, sin would lead to self-destruction. Those are choices that we have. What about some little choices? Can we have some examples of little choices? Brushing teeth. Yes, brushing our teeth. What about what time to go to bed? Should I have my morning devotions? Should I eat breakfast? Should I run the yellow light? Should I run the red light? Should I pray before I drive? Should I procrastinate with my homework? What will I eat? What will I wear? Those are all little choices that we have in our lives. There's many more, of course. But how many choices do you think we make on average each day? Each day we make many, many choices. But how many? Give me an example. Who has an idea? 
A hundred more, more than that, much more. 30,000? Hudson, you're pretty good at, at guessing. <laughs> you're very close. So we have some wise people in this church. I've preached this sermon before. This is my third time preaching this study. And Daphne guessed the, ch the choice. The, Daphne was the one who mentioned the most important choice. No one else mentioned that as a big choice before. And Hudson got the closest someone has gotten on how many choices we make. So how many choices do you think we make? You think it's 30,000 more or less? A little more. We make on average 35,000 choices a day. If, for example, if the average person sleeps seven hours a night, and let's say that's a choice-free time where you're sleeping blissfully, you're not, not making any choices, any decisions, during the daytime, during our awake hours, we make an average of 35,000 decisions each day, one decision every two seconds of waking time, 2,000 decisions every hour. When you think about it, we're constantly making decisions. We make a decision if we're going to sit like this. We make a decision if we're going to sleep like this. If we're going to turn our head here. If we're going to put our hands in our pockets. If we're going to think about this while I'm talking to you about something else. We're constantly making these decisions. We can be doing multiple things at the same time. And that's a lot of decisions, right? 35,000 choices a day, that's a ton. But what is arguably life's greatest choice? Daphne mentioned it. We have a choice every day if we want to serve God or not. Every day we have the greatest choice that we can make out of those 35,000 is if we want to serve God. If we want to read about him or not. If we want to pray to him. If we want to obey him or not. So what is your choice on this? What has been your choice on this? When God first created life, when he made beings, when he made angels, they were also given the ability to choose. They were not forced to serve God. They were not forced to obey him. Adam and Eve also had the same choice. They were put into the Garden of Eden, but God is not a God of force. So he didn't just give them, you know, the option to just serve him. That would have been restricting them. He gave them the option to obey him or to disobey him. And uh, let's take a look at that. Let's read that in Genesis chapter 2. Open with me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. Genesis 2, 15 through 16. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But um, in verse 17 it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So what here does it say? God said, you can, you can eat of any of the trees in the garden, whichever one you like, but don't eat this tree. And they had the choice if they wanted to or not. And was that such a big thing? I mean, they just made one choice that they wanted to eat from that tree. How many times did they eat from that tree? How many days? How many months? How many years? Just one. Is it possible that just one choice can affect my eternity and my destiny? Is it possible that just one choice in just one day of our lives, out of all the thousands of choices we make, can affect my eternal life, my eternity? It is. So there's a lot of choices that we have, and they can have a big impact on our life. So how do each of these choices that we make affect us? Well, let's take a look at two examples in the Bible. At men, kings, who made big choices. And just one big choice affected them drastically in different ways. Let's look at our first example, the example of king, the youngest king in the, in the Bible. Who was this? Who, who was the youngest king? Joash or Jehoash is, is how it says his name. So Joash or King Jehoash, he was um, the youngest king of Israel. 
So he was hid by his aunt in the temple for six years. And his aunt was the wife of priest Jehoiada, who was a very godly man and a good man. Priest Jehoiada actually lived to 130 years. So that's quite a while at that time. Let's read the example of King Joash in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. So why did Joash be, uh, become a king at such a young age? Because his grandma, Athaliah, was an evil lady. After his, Joash's dad died, his grandma killed all of her grandsons. That's what she thought, except King Joash. He was one years old and somebody hid him in the temple. His aunt hid him. Otherwise, because his, his grandma, why did she do that? She wanted to be queen, and she became queen for a while. She was an evil queen. So 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. And Joash became king at a very early age, right? How old was he? Seven years old. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Joash took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. So here we see that Joash, all the days while the priest was living, which was a while, he was doing what was right for the Lord. He was doing good things. He was a young king, but he was doing good things. What did he do? In verse 4, we said, we read that he was minded to what? Repair the temple. So the temple, Solomon's temple, had been destroyed. Solomon's temple had been desecrated, and they weren't using it anymore And for sacrifices and for offerings. And he helped to repair the temple. They started bringing offerings. They collected money to repair the temple. And they started worshiping the Lord there again. And uh, it says that they gathered money in abundance. Look at verse uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 11 and 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, look at verse 11 and 12. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. So they were gathering money. They were collecting money to repair the temple. And Joash um, brought workmen. He brought people who were good with metal, who were good with wood, who could make vessels, silver spoons, gold and silver vessels for the Lord. He did all of this. And they started offering to the Lord continually, day by day, only while, um, only while Jehoiada was alive. But look here, what happened when, King Je when uh, priest Jehoiada died? Look at verse 17 and 18. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God their, of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. So look here. This young king, he was faithfully serving the Lord. But after the priest died, the princes came to him and they did what to him? They bowed before him. So interestingly, when, when, when people come to you and say, oh, you're so good, you're the best, and you know, we love you so much, and they're praising him, and they bowed before him. You know, he felt good about himself, and he unfortunately listened to them. What does it say? He hearkened unto them. He listened to them, and they started doing evil. They started worshiping false gods, groves, worshiping in, uh, they had uh, groves of trees where they would worship false gods and idols. And keep on reading in verse 19 through 21. Joash was given some warnings, you know. The Lord didn't just leave him to worship the false gods. What did the Lord do for Joash? It says in verse 19, verse 19 through 21, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again to the Lord, and they testified against them, but 
they would not give ear. So here it's, we're looking at the case of King Joash. The Lord is sending him prophets. He's sending prophets to him, to Israel, to say, come back to the Lord. But he wouldn't hear. Well, how about you or me? What if we were in his situation? Would we, would we listen to the prophets? Hopefully. I mean, it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, of course I would. But how about in our daily lives? When the Lord gives us warnings by his Holy Spirit, when he gives us warnings when we study his word, when he touches us by his Holy Spirit, when we know we shouldn't do something, but we still do it anyways, are we disregarding the warnings? If we can't listen to the little warnings that God gives us, how are we going to listen to something like this? Not only did God send prophets to him, God sent his stepbrother to warn him. Because remember that Joash, all his brothers were killed, and he was raised by King Jehoiada and his wife in the temple. So the Lord sent to him his stepbrother. His name was Zechariah. Look at this in verse 20. And the Spirit of the Lord came unto Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Why transgress ye the commandment of the lo- commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath forsaken you. And Joash was really good when he heard his stepbrother, he listened to him. Is that what the Bible says? Look at verse 20. Verse 21, sorry. What do they do to his stepbrother? Then, thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada, his father or his stepfather, had done, done to him. Sorry, I'm read- I got lost there. Um, yeah, verse 22. But slew his son, and when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. So he slew his stepbrother. He slew the son of the man who raised him and who saved him from getting killed from his grandma. See, the Lord was giving him all these warnings, trying to shake him up, trying to wake him up so he could choose to serve the Lord, but <clears throat> it didn't work. Now, after this, the Lord actually sent uh, the Syrians. The Syrians came with a very small army, if you keep on reading. And with a little small army, God allowed them to fight against the Israelites, and he allowed them to win. And they destroyed many princes in Judah and Jerusalem. And they sent the spoil to their king in Damascus. But do you think when the Syrians attacked the Israelites, do you think King Joash died? Was he captured here? He was not captured, and he did not die. Why? Well, God was merciful to him, and God gave him another chance to make a choice, right? To choose God. He had one more chance. He had some trials, right? We have some trials in our lives sometimes that shake us up. Some trials sometimes in our lives that wake us up, or they should wake us up. But here, this king's country is attacked. His country is defeated. A lot of his, a lot of his princes, a lot of the people in his nation are captured. They're killed. They're taken as slaves to another country. And this did not wake up the king. Here he could have made one more choice. But did he choose to repent to God? He didn't. Now what would have happened if Joash would have decided to repent to the Lord then? You think God would have accepted him or forgiven him? Yes, he would have. Look at Psalms 91 verse 15. Psalms 91 verse 15. So Psalms, what chapter are we going to? 91. Do you all have this chapter memorized? Psalms chapter 91? I hope so. If not, it's a good one to memorize. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. What does God do when we call upon him? What will God do if we call upon him with our whole heart? He will answer. What will God do if we are in trouble? He will deliver us if we call upon him. And he's going to honor us. And uh, do you think King Joash did that? 
He didn't. He had an opportunity to. He didn't. His end was very sad. He chose not to serve God. You know what happened to him? He ended up actually being killed by two of his servants on his bed at the young age of 47. We can read that in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And we'll see what was the result. Sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 24 verse 25. Uh, verse 25 and 26. And when they departed from him, they left him in great diseases. So this is when the Syrians left Joash. The Syrians left him in great diseases. But he still didn't repent to God, and his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest. That means he killed many of his stepbrothers, or more of them. And they slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchers of the king. So it's very sad, his end. All because what? Of how many choices? One choice. If he would have made one choice to serve God, again, would God have forgiven him or accepted him? He would have. Let's look at an, our second example today. Our second example now is of the king who reigned the longest. Who is the king who reigned the longest in Israel? Not David. David reigned a long time, though. Someone else. It's in 2 Chronicles, too. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Now, this was a wicked king. This was an evil king. This king was more evil than the kings from the other surrounding nations. 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. King Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old. He was a young king when he started reigning. And how long did he reign? How long was he king? Manasseh was 12 years old, and he reigned 50 in five years. He reigned for 55 years as king. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And look at verse 3. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. This was Hezekiah's king, I mean son. Hezekiah had repaired the temple. They were worshiping God. He built again the high places. He reared up altars for Balaam. He made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Now look at verse 6. Take a look at verse 6. What did he do? He was so wicked, you know what King Manasseh did? How bad was he? Look at verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Hinnom. He put his children, his own children, through the fire. He was into crazy witchcraft and crazy devilish beliefs and practices. He also observed times and used enchantments. And he used witchcraft and he dealt with a familiar spirit. Now, what does it mean if you deal with a familiar spirit? Who are you dealing with? Satan. Satan. Either Satan or Satan's evil angels, right? You know how King Saul went to the familiar spirit? He, he went to the, the, the witch and she brought him a familiar spirit? Now that was just one time, but it says he communed with, fam with a familiar spirit. This was regularly. He was talking to to evil angels, demons regularly, and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Now look at verse, um, verse 9. How bad was King Manasseh? Verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to sin, to err, and to do how bad? Worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So the Lord brought Israel, he said, destroy all the people of Canaan, all the inhabitants, because they're bad, they're evil, they're, their cup of iniquity is full, right? And here, this king of Israel, he does worse than those people. He was doing crazy things. Now, how far did Manasseh go? We know he killed his own children. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 16. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 16. How far did he go?
Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood. How much innocent blood? A little? Very much. Very much. Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to, the, to another, beside his sin where which he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Does it mean that Manasseh literally filled Jerusalem from one end to the other with blood? With innocent blood? Did he really fill the whole streets of Jerusalem with innocent blood? Probably not, but this is giving us the idea that he killed a ton of people, a ton of innocent people all over Jerusalem, right? This corner, that corner, that part of the city, this part of the city, all the innocent good people who loved the Lord, most of them he was killing them. He was just killing them, putting them to death. He was a wicked man. And among those innocent people that we're reading about, who did he kill? Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah. How do we know? The spirit of prophecy tells us, but even rabbin rabbinical tradition, the old tradition from the rabbis, according to the oral rabbinical tradition, Manasseh executed the prophet Isaiah by having him sawn asunder. What does that mean? Cut in half. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, in Hebrews 11:37, it talks about those who were sawn asunder in the faith chapter. That was prophet Isaiah. Now, prophet Isaiah, he wrote about Christ, some beautiful prophecies. He had a nice, you know, a wonderful book in the Bible. He had a great work in, in prophesying about Christ. This man was cut in half by King Manasseh. And these oral traditions from the rabbinical traditions were put into writing, and this information can be found both in the Jerusalem Talmud as well as the Babylonian Talmud. And, of course, the spirit of prophecy tells us that he killed prophet Isaiah. So what kind of choices was King Manasseh making in his life? Whew, terrible choices, right? Bad ones, day after day, probably thousands. We know we make 35,000 choices a day. He was doing thousands of bad choices for years. He was king for 55 years. And look at 2 Chronicles. Come back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 10. You think the Lord was trying to get him to make the right choice? You think the Lord was trying to talk to him to make the right choice? Oh, yes. You think the Lord was trying to talk to Hitler to make the right choice? You think he's trying to talk to Putin to make the right choices? To Donald Trump, to Biden, to Pamela Harris, to all of them. The Lord is trying to talk to everyone, every human being. He's trying to get us to make the right choice in our lives. And look at verse uh, 2 Chronicles 33.10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but what choice did they make? What was their choice? But they would not hearken. And, and look at verse uh, 11. Look at verse 11. The Lord then brought some trials to their lives. Why does God bring trials to our lives sometimes? To wake us up. Wherefore the Lord, Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Syria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. What does it mean that they took Manasseh among the thorns? Does anyone have any idea? Among the thorns? If you look at the Amplified Bible, the Amplified Bible for this verse says, So the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks through his nose or cheeks and bound him with bronze chains and brought him to Babylon. You know, back then, you know what they did for servants when they had a servant? They would bore holes through his ears or through his nose or something, and he would be, and then that would show he's like your servant for life. So here they put, they put holes through Manasseh's nose or his cheeks and hooked him with hooks, bound him with chains, and they carried him to Babylon. And uh, God allowed him to have some trials. Why? To shake him up, to wake him up, to give him one more opportunity to make a choice to serve him. And what did Manasseh do when he was in his affliction? Look at verse 12, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 12. 
and when he was in affliction. In a foreign country, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Here he decided to make a choice. This king had done so much wickedness. He had killed so many people. He killed his children, put them through the fire, worshipped false gods, talked to devils and demons and false spirits. He was taken as a captive to Assyria. He was probably put in prison. And then he decides, over there, I'm going to choose to serve you, God. I'm going to choose to obey you, God. And for many people, they could choose that. And what happens if they would have been executed the next day? Would it have been the right choice? It would have been, right? If they would have been executed the next day, it would have been the best choice of their life. And that was a thief on the cross. He was with Jesus, and he was a thief. Okay, maybe he wasn't such a bad man, but he hung out with the wrong crowd. He ended up doing some bad things. He ended up getting captured. He was put on the cross, but he made one choice. How many choices? Just one choice, and that choice was the choice. That was the best decision of his life. That man, the thief on the cross, will be for eternity with Jesus. So here, Manasseh decides in his affliction, in the prison, in the dungeon, I'm going to turn to the Lord. But he turns to the Lord with his whole heart, you know. It says he humbled himself. He humbled himself greatly. He cried to the Lord. He sobbed to the Lord. He confessed his sins. And look at verse 13. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 33, 13. And he prayed unto him. And what happened when Manasseh prayed unto God? What happens when you and I pray to God and humble ourselves before God? And he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication. And he brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Isn't that amazing? Manasseh prayed to the Lord from the dungeon. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard him. And I don't know how this happened, but only the Lord could do this because this is a big miracle. The Lord brought him from being a prisoner in a foreign country. How do you become a, go from being a prisoner in a foreign country to coming back to your country and becoming king again? It doesn't make sense. Only a miracle. Of course, the Lord touched the king's heart of Assyria. They set him free. They let him go. Now, if, as I mentioned, even if that didn't happen, would it have been the best choice for him? It would have been the best choice for him because not only, he wouldn't only, uh, I mean, he would have died in peace, but he would have had eternity in heaven above. So the choice that Manasseh made while he was in prison was the best choice of his life. In one day, he made one choice that turned out to be the best choice of his life. So what is your choice? What is my choice? We all have decisions in our lives. We all have choices to make. What we do with our time, what we do with our money, what we do with our thoughts, what we do with our affections. If we're going to pray to God each day, if we're going to spend time with him, if we're going to obey God when the Holy Spirit talks to us, when we know we shouldn't do something that's wrong, we all have these choices. God is talking to us each day through his Holy Spirit, and he wants us to choose him. He gives us these opportunities to choose him over and over again. Every day that we wake up, we have the choice if we want to serve him. We have the choice if we want to choose him. Every time we're tempted, we have the choice if we want to choose him. Every time we feel like being discouraged or depressed or sad or upset, we have the choice if we want to serve him or choose him. And uh, many times we have temptations in our lives and we think, well, this is just too difficult. I can't overcome this. I can't face this, what I'm going through right now. But the nice thing is that we can remember that if we choose to serve him, do we have to struggle with our difficulty with our temptation, with our depression, with our discouragement? Do we have to struggle anymore with that? We don't have to anymore. 
because Jesus has overcome. He's given us the victory. Jesus can give us the victory over every sin, over every temptation. All we have to do is choose to what? Accept it and to serve him. So God is asking us to choose him, and he's begging us to choose him, actually, in Isaiah. So prophet Isaiah, who was killed by Manasseh, wrote about God requesting us or begging us to choose him. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, and we'll read verses 1 through 3. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 3. Here it says that, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What is this talking about? For the people who don't have money to buy milk for their cereal? Is this talking about for the people who are thirsty physically? No. Jesus told the woman at the well, Come to me, and what are you going to have? How, how much longer will you be thirsty? You won't be thirsty again. You're never going to thirst again. So here, Isaiah is saying, so Jesus knew the prophecies, and here Isaiah is saying, come to me, everyone that's thirsty. Thirsty for what? Thirsty for the water of life. And what does the water of life give us? Peace, joy, happiness, he says, come, even if you don't have money, come and buy of me. How can we buy of him? All he wants us is to do is to choose him. And verse 2, it says, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is not, which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in its fatness. So here he's saying, why are you wasting your time and your money for the foolish things in life? For that which doesn't satisfy? I mean, a good cake really satisfies me, I'm telling you, and some good ice cream. But it doesn't last long. You know, it only lasts <laughs> for that moment, for 15, 20 minutes. Maybe you have that satisfaction. But here, Isaiah is saying, that's not it. You know, don't spend your, yeah, it's nothing wrong to have good cake and good ice cream. But here, Isaiah is saying, that's not it. That's not everything. Don't spend your money and your time. Don't focus your life on that. Get something that satisfies you for how long? Eternity. How long do you think heaven is going to satisfy us? How long do you think the new earth will satisfy us? Forever. We're going to be completely, fully satisfied. That's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> and then... He's continuing to beg us in verse 3. Incline your ear. Listen, come unto me and hear. And what? Your soul shall live. So do you remember that when God created man, man became a living what? Soul. So here it says your soul shall live. You're going to have eternal life if you do this. And I will make you what? An everlasting covenant. Even the sure mercies of David. So how can we make the choice to serve God? Steps to Christ has a beautiful passage in, on page 47. The book Steps to Christ that I love. It's one of my favorite books. It has a beautiful passage on page 47 where it says, Many are inquiring, how, can I, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God. You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to what? In slavery to sin? In slavery to doubt. And controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. And I can make this personal. This is me. When I read this, I see myself here. My promises and my, uh, my promises and my pledges, they're like ropes of sand. We were talking about ropes of sand this morning. How, long does, how, how good does a rope of sand hold? It doesn't hold at all. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge 
of your own broken promises and your forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity. Doesn't that happen sometimes? Sometimes we make these promises that we're going to serve the Lord, promises that I'm never going to do that again, promises that I'm going to be faithful to the Lord, promises that this is the last time I'm going to do that. And how long does that last? And here it says that sometimes we, question, we might question our own sincerity. We might wonder, well, why do I keep on struggling with this? Why do I keep on falling with this? Am I even, am I even being genuine? Am I even being true? Why is God not, God not letting me overcome this? The problem is that we are trying to overcome it. And we'll see that here. Your, the knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair. Why should we not despair? What you need to understand is the true force of the will. So if you were sleeping this whole sermon, you need to wake up because you need to hear this part. That's to everyone here. If you're sleeping, it's time to wake up because I have something that you need to hear right now. The most important part of this sermon is what? I'll read it again. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. If we can understand the true force of the will, what is that going to do for me? If I understand the true force of the will, why is this so important for me to hear? This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision and of choice. So what is our sermon called today? The choice. The choice, choice, right? We all have a will. This is the true power of decision and the governing nature of man. Everything depends on the right action of the will. What does that mean? Everything depends on the right action of our choice or our choices, of our decisions. Everything, everything. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. Do you, each and every one of you, have the power to choose? Do you have the power to choose? Yes, we do. We might not have the power to obey God. We might not have the power to have the victory on our own. But if we choose to serve him, what happens? He helps us. He gives us the power. And then it's not our power anymore. It's not our struggle anymore. It's his power. We just have to choose to serve him. The power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. Listen to this. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve him. Did you hear that? You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do to his good pleasure. Once we give our will to God, God starts working in us to will and to do his good pleasure. Thus, your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit of Christ, of the Spirit of Christ, and your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Our sermon today was entitled, The Choice. We have the ability to choose. God has given us the decision-making ability to choose him or not. He has given us the will. But at the end of the day, it's up to me and you what we choose. If we choose him, if we say, God, I choose you, I need your help, will he give us the strength? Will he give us the power? He will. If God could save King Manasseh, he definitely could save us, right? He definitely can have mercy upon us if he could sing, save King Manasseh. And let's read our last two verses for this morning, found in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and 7. When should we choose to serve God? 
When should we make that choice? Manasseh had a lot of opportunities to serve him, and God let him live a long time to serve him, but he could have died earlier, and he would have, would have been lost. But we're still alive today, and we have that choice today. And it says in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. When is he found? He's found right now. If we're not here tomorrow, he won't be able to be found by us because we'll be gone. We won't be able to seek for him. If probation, when probation closes for us, he won't be able to be found for us. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. Amen. May God help us to choose him. Amen.